every day, people make independent choices that will place them on the right or wrong side of history. But here's the thing, making the wrong choice is easy. It's making the right choice that's tough. It's taking the unpopular route to challenge oppressive regimes or damaging rhetoric that you'll find is uncomfortable and takes guts. In history, Tudor Queen Anne Boleyn is a great example of this because she was willing to make herself very unpopular with the oppressors in order to be on the right side of history. Not that you'd know it. Anne Boleyn is someone whose story has been twisted and manipulated, whose activism continues to be silenced and suppressed. But if we can learn how history really unfolded, based on the evidence of choices made by silenced women like Anne Boleyn, then we can make informed decisions in our own lives now as we begin to recognize these same scenarios and work to ensure that history never repeats again. Now, when it comes to decisions that have changed the fate of a country, few are more impactful than Anne Boleyn marrying King Henry VIII and triggering the religious reformation in England. But before that momentous event, in a true heads or tails moment, we actually get to see the consequences of Anne's earliest choices play out when she first attempts to refuse the king's advances. A somewhat unpopular decision, according to Henry VIII. Written evidence in Henry's own letters reveals that Anne made the drastic decision to leave court for a year, abandoning her position serving the queen in order to escape him. She declared her affections had changed. The king even berated her for ignoring one of his letters. Now, in 1526, there are various reasons why you would turn down an affair with the King of England. Him fighting to oppress the evangelical beliefs you held near and dear to your heart is right up there with Anne not likely wanting to become a pregnant royal mistress nor pick a fight with the queen. Oh, whose nephew just happened to be the Holy Roman Emperor, the most powerful ruler in Europe. So far from Anne seducing the king and plotting to wed, as a commoner bringing no international political alliance, Anne would never have imagined marriage to the monarch a possibility. But by the following year, in 1527, Henry VIII had witnessed his own sister, Margaret, Queen of Scots, successfully petition the Pope for a divorce of her own. This seemingly giving him all the ammunition he needed to break with his wife and propose marriage to Anne a few months later. So what did Anne do? Swoon at the thought of power and glory, Party her days away, tormenting every dastardly foe at court. Actually, no. Um, contrary to popular belief, Anne decided to use her newly bestowed privilege as the king's fiance to incite positive change for the people. And we know this because we witness it in her immediate actions challenging the authority of Cardinal Wolsey, the king's all-powerful advisor, when campaigning for the release of a detained reformist, the parson of Honey Lane. This was five years before she gained the protection of her title as queen. Archives reveal that Anne rescued another of Wolsey's reformist prisoners, Mr. Betts, before bringing him into her inner circle and making him her chaplain. And in 1528, there is also evidence of the king's first communication with the German Lutheran princes. This was the start of negotiations for an alliance with England that at that early stage, only the reformist Anne Boleyn could have been behind. You know, just in case things didn't work out with the Pope. But it was after her marriage, 
in 1533 that we reach Anne Boleyn's two life-changing and deeply unpopular decisions from which we can learn a significant lesson. The first, as we've already seen, saw Anne shunning a life of ease for a life of activism and amnesty. Her chaplain, William Latimer, tells how she fought against the duping of the public by intercepting the sale of access to fake holy relics. Evidence tells how Anne established a revolutionary Bible study group for those who couldn't read the Latin scripture. A rather contentious issue for the reformists who claimed that some Catholic preachers were twisting the Latin scripture whilst hiding behind the language barrier. This in order to sell forgiveness for sins. Indeed, one preacher, Johann Hetzel, claimed that the so-called indulgence he was selling was so potent it could forgive the sins of a man who had violated the Virgin Mary. A tad blasphemous. And so you start to get a sense of the manipulation of the public that the evangelical Anne Boleyn was fighting against. A fight she didn't need to involve herself in. The religious reformation already had the likes of Martin Luther in Germany, Jacques Lefebvre de Tapla in France, Huldrych Zwingli in Switzerland, and William Tyndale in England, all fighting for the cause. But Anne Boleyn stepped up and stepped in, lending her power to the people's fight. Alas, it would be Anne's second unpopular decision that would ultimately be the catalyst for her demise. Because Anne wasn't taken down for failing to give England a son, but for championing a radical anti-poverty law. The king's new advisor, Thomas Cromwell, framed Anne for adultery. Ambassador Chapuis reporting after several conversations with Cromwell that he brought about the whole affair. This, I have discovered, is because Anne tried to create a rival government council to Cromwell's King's Privy Council in order to launch the Tudor's first national job centre and access to free health care. It was Anne's protege, William Marshall, who first proposed that she present this revolutionary scheme to the king, with Henry VIII going on to personally lobby it in Parliament. But this is where it appears that Cromwell sabotaged Anne and Marshall's most ambitious plans, replacing it with a drastically diluted version. Minus the rival council, and merely consisting of donation boxes and a ban on begging. To add insult to injury, history has christened it Cromwell's poor law ever since. Now, knowing how those accusations of adultery turned out for Anne, and if you don't, unfortunately, she was number two in the divorced, beheaded, died history rhyme. You might look at the true story of Anne Boleyn and think, why did she make life harder for herself? Why stand in the line of fire when she could have lived a quiet, exceptionally privileged life? Why? Why do that? But this is where it comes down to making independent choices that will place us on the right or wrong side of history. Because how at peace with yourself can you truly be when you're aware of the suffering and injustice in the world and yet turn a blind eye because it's not directly impacting you? Now look, I don't advocate making unpopular choices lightly because for all the good she did in her lifetime, Anne was still besmirched in death, proving that if people don't like what you stand for, they will be intent on misunderstanding you, looking for a way to twist any good deed. Such as the evidence of Anne's decision not to join her husband in wearing yellow and celebrating the death of his first wife and queen, Catherine of Aragon. 
For this, there is only one contemporary report from Chapuis in which he confirms Anne was left behind in Greenwich when the king departed for the distasteful celebrations in London. Yet when her oppressors smeared her name after death, history was rewritten, and we are now told it was Anne who celebrated in yellow. So if the consequences of Anne's decision here is to teach us anything, it's that decisions must be made for the impact and contribution they will have in history, not for fleeting praise or glory. As Anne discovered, there's never a guarantee you will see either in your lifetime. Now I know I'm really selling the whole concept of making unpopular choices, aren't I? <laughs> but this is why, like Anne, we need to pick our battles carefully. Make change where we can. For Anne, it was aiding reformists cast out in their communities. It was funding students launching her own grammar school with free scholarships. It was having her ladies make smocks for the poor, not only to combat infection, but as martyrologist John Fox explained, for the ladies to appreciate their privilege. It was campaigning for those without a voice, the single mothers and homeless losing their place of refuge as the monasteries were dissolved. Anne ruffled feathers by getting involved, but she knew that to be silent is to be complicit. Of course, even when you know you're making the right choice, well, it's never a particularly easy route to take. And as I say that, it sounds like the ultimate understatement. People will work against you. Your own family and friends may discourage you from wading into contentious issues. Anne Boleyn's own father, Thomas Boleyn, and her uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, far from pushing her into the king's bed, actively worked to stop the marriage from happening a year earlier than it did. A report to King Charles V of Spain reveals that her uncle insisted they were neither the originator or promoter of this marriage. Her father even feigned frenzy in order to dissuade them from following through. They knew the war it would cause, the unrest, the attacks. But Anne didn't intend to work alone. She protected herself by gaining support and strength from the faction around her. And to anyone looking to follow in Anne's footsteps in any area, cause, or mission in your life, learn from Berlin. She didn't do this by herself. She lifted others up with her, putting those who supported the people's cause in positions of power. So in turn, they could action change within their own communities, like her chaplains around the country and Archbishop Thomas Cranmer. Surrounding yourself with others fighting for your cause will always benefit you. In fact, Anne's faction became so powerful that when William Brereton blocked the dissolution of the monasteries in Cheshire, he was brought down with his queen, accused of adultery alongside Anne. Again with the buzzkill. Sorry. <laughs> okay, let's end on a high. A note of inspiration, if you will. No, the majority of people today may not realize that Anne Boleyn was fighting for them. But do you know who was aware of it? The people she saved, those imprisoned for their religious beliefs, cast out in their communities, the poor who couldn't afford an education, those who received smocks to help fight against illness and infection, in every way, large and small, Anne Boleyn's true story tells us that sometimes using your voice and making an unpopular decision is worth the discomfort for the positive impact it will have, whilst also ensuring we stay on the right side of history. Thank you. Thank you.